Okay, welcome to Generous Theology. This is Brock and Chuck, and Chuck, what an honor to be spending this time with this beautiful text, and, and I'm talking here about Herman Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics. We are in Volume 1, in Part 2, The History and Literature of Dogmatic Theology, and we are in Chapter 3, The Formation of Dogma, East and West. And we are finishing up a section titled East and West Meet in Augustine, and then moving into a section called Augustine's Legacy. So for folks following along with us, we will be mostly in paragraph or or pericope 44, uh, Augustine's Legacy. And uh, Chuck, I just wanted to to say to you what what a satisfying chapter this is to read, not just because I'm a a big Augustine fan, and Bavink really tickles the ivories for Augustine in such a satisfying way, but but because he does do this, I mean there are there are reasons to to have a high opinion of Augustine, perhaps even in spite of recent scholarship efforts, maybe of the last fifty to a hundred years, that have almost seemed to want to downplay Augustine who he is, the impact that he had, and the status of uh, the doctrines that he made so accessible and approachable in the church. And I just wondered how you felt about that as you were, you know, transitioning in this part of the read the reading at a high level. Yeah, you know, I I think it's fair to say that I've always had a high view of Augustine. My my education has always been, you know, consisted of folks who had good things to say about Augustine and, you know, not a lot of criticism. I do know that there are, you know, there are a few places where we might have a few minor qualms with with Augustine. I know that, for example, there was only a few months ago on, on the Desiring God blog, there was a an article about whether Augustine got a few things wrong with regard to justification, and but even in that, even in that argument, there's a lot of you know a lot of thought of of how much you know how how much good Augustine gave, and really more the the answer that's given is that well we can't really say Augustine got it wrong. It's just that maybe he wasn't as precise as we could be later on. It's only because of Augustine that we're able to be more precise in talking about some of these doctrines because he developed them in a particular way. But other than that, and and I've heard some criticism of Augustine outside of my own Reformed tradition. I know I've engaged with a number of Roman Catholics, and and there I think there are there are some in the Roman Catholic tradition who really love Augustine in the same way that 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 you and I and clearly Herman Pavic does. But there are a few that are a little more critical as well. Well, and I, but I think it comes down to some of those same issues where Augustine, being sort of the developer of so much of the dogma and the doctrine of the church today, as the developer, there are a few places where perhaps he didn't get to fill in all the details. And so there's a sense in which maybe it's not so much that we disagree with Augustine as it is we disagree with certain interpretations or certain folks who draw certain conclusions from certain things that Augustine has said. And certainly uh, Bavink, you know, there's no doubt Bavink, you know, sings high high praises of Augustine. That that last paragraph of of that Pericope 43 is just I mean, it's 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 a song of praise in many ways of of the importance of Augustine not only to Reformed folks but to the whole church, to the universal church, and it, it's yeah, and and I I would have to say that in my experience as well, I think Bavink's view is is, is also reflects the way that I've seen it as well, that there's just so much there in Augustine. I'm glad that, for example, that all three of my kids, when they went to two different universities, both Reformed universities, but all three of them had to read Augustine in in some class or another during their their times at both at Calvin University and at Dort University. So because there is so much important about what, what he writes, and it's still relevant today, you know, more than, you know, more than 1500 years later. What a beautiful way to start to pull the threads together. And where I want to go with this is is to read that last paragraph, that compelling paragraph that Bavink wrote. And I think we'll have to talk about 
the kinds of issues that modern critics bring up, but I think that I think that we can look to this paragraph from Bavink as evidence that the main thrust of modern criticism, which is to say that Augustine in some way, which is not clearly spelled out, Augustine bewitched the Western theological and philosophical world and grossly overstated things, as well as other accusations of him being, for example, smuggling Gnosticism into the church, other sorts of maybe scurrilous accusations relating to the role that he played in his interactions with Pelagius, for example. I think I think we'll see that there's that it's perhaps the modern critics who we need to examine a little more carefully here. And and that's a measured way of saying something that I mean to be a little bit sharper, but but let's go through it. And first of all, let me read that beautiful paragraph from the end of Pericope 43 uh, that Bavink writes. And like you said, it's high praise indeed. And this is one of those paragraphs that, you know, if I if I had to pick one of the most satisfying reads in Reform Dogmatics, this would this would be one of those paragraphs. A top three, top five, at least. But anyway, let me just read it. Bavink says, Thus Augustine became a theologian of the greatest importance for later dogmatic, one who dominated the following centuries. Every Reformation returned to him and to Paul. For every dogma, he found a formula that was taken over and repeated by everyone else. His influence extends to all churches, schools of theology, and sects. Rome appeals to him for its doctrine of the church, the sacrament, and authority. While the Reformation felt kinship with him in the doctrine of predestination and grace, scholasticism, in, construct, in constructing its conceptual framework, took advantage of his sharp observation, the acuteness of his intellect, the power of his speculation. Thomas Aquinas, in fact, was called the best interpreter of St. Augustine. Mysticism, in turn, found inspiration in his Neoplatonism and religious enthusiasm. Both Catholic and Protestant piety buoy themselves on his writing. Asceticism and pietism find nourishment and support in his work. Augustine, therefore, does not belong to one church, but to all churches together. He is the universal teacher, the doctor, universalis. Even philosophy neglect him to its own detriment, and because of his elegant and fascinating style, his refined, precise, highly individual, and nevertheless universally human way of expressing himself, he, more than any other church father, can still be appreciated today. He is the most Christian as well as the most modern of all the father of all of them. He is closest to us. He replaced the aesthetic worldview with an ethical one, the classical worldview with the Christian. In dogmatics, we owe our best, our deepest, our richest thoughts to him. Augustine has been and is the dogmatician of the Christian church. Now, Chuck, I want to read that paragraph again. It's so, it's so good. I'm just going to read the last sentence. Augustine has been and is the dogmatician of the Christian church. It's very difficult to make universalistic statements without potentially getting yourself into trouble. And yet, in this statement, as intense as it is, as highly as it values Augustine, I think we see one of the most mature theological statements from Bavink that I think there is to make. Augustine has been and is the dogmatician of the Christian church. Let me throw it over to you, my friend, for some thoughts. Yeah, I, I don't know that there's much more that that we can add to that. You know, that's it's it's high words of praise. I think, you know, what what I really appreciate about Bavink here as well is that he recognizes that Augustine really it belongs to the whole church. There's sometimes, I think, a tendency uh, for folks to want to claim people like Augustine for their, for their own. 
and deny him to others. In fact, I I had just seen an example of that just in preparing today as well. There's a a website called catholicfidelity.com, which is sort of a, a, not just a Catholic site, but a, a an apologist, a, apologetic site for Catholics that defends traditional Catholic beliefs as a, as opposed to Protestant beliefs. And uh, you know, in the, on, on that page, there's a, a writer probably at the bottom of the of it here. I'll look for it. No, I don't. I don't see the name who wrote it. But in, in any case, the, a writer who who talks about how, well, hey, what do you mean? How how can you how can you possibly say that that Augustine is some kind of proto Protestant? He he goes, you know, people who say that they they overlook the fact that they are that that Augustine and Aquinas he's also talking about they are in actuality the quintessential Catholics. These are our guys. They don't belong to you. And then you know, I think we sometimes see that on the on the Protestant and on the Reform side as well as like, no no no. Augustine's our guy. He's he's totally against you, you guys. And and what Bavink does here, and and interestingly, and I think importantly, at a time when the divide between Catholic and Protestant was in some ways much more sharp, that you know, at, at a time and a place and a country where a lot of a lot of reform folks didn't even think Catholics were Christian, and and vice versa. Bavink gives Augustine credit as being a doctor universalis. He doesn't belong to one church, but to all churches together. And then points out that even philosophers, and I think one of the things that you can read in Bavink here is that even non-Christian philosophers neglect Augustine to their own detriment. And and, and I think that's, that is important. Augustine is uh, a seminal character in not just theology, not just dogmatics, but realistically in philosophy. And we've seen that, uh, you know, in, in some of the studies that we've done as well, both of in medieval philosophy and then in 19th century philosophy. You know, Augustine really is that seminal character that that everybody is sort of building off of or reacting to in some way. And so, of course, I think, you know, you've, you've mentioned that there are some modern and perhaps postmodern thinkers today who are critical of Augustine, are critical of certain tendencies of Augustine and want to move away from that. In some ways, that's even even that is 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 sort of a, a, a backhanded compliment to Augustine that that people, you know, in in 2022 are still writing articles about, well, I don't know, should we really pay that a close attention to Augustine? Is did he really get that really right? And still talking about this guy from from more than a millennium and a half ago, I mean, that in many ways that is real praise because what it's saying is that he's still relevant. And and as as Bavink puts it, even philosophy neglects him to its own detriment, even those philosophers who disagree with. Him. So good stuff. And and Bavink doesn't pull any punches in, in 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 his praise of Augustine here. I am looking at a a text written by an atheist. So this is Robert Paul Wolf text about philosophy. And in it he has on the front cover, he has a history timeline of the important philosophers. And probably 25, 30 philosophers are on this timeline throughout history, starting from about 650 BC to our modern age. And of these 35, maybe 40 philosophers, he does have a couple of Christians. But considering the role Christianity has played in the West, even especially in philosophy and theology. It's quite lean. So we we have Albertus Magnus, we have Aquinas, we have René Descartes, and I'm checking out here to see if there's anybody else I'm missing. But we do have, in antiquity, we have him mentioning Augustine. Now, it's worth throwing out that this is a hard situation to be in. Why, Why should Augustine be this doctor universalist? And why do so many different groups steam him? In fact, maybe except for Thomas Aquinas, maybe except for Gregory the Great, maybe except for Martin Luther, it is really difficult to find anyone so central to the Christian faith. Now, this has provoked this critical response, however, and and I'm not sure I'm not sure how to engage with the critic. 
because it seems that the attack occurs in the area of narrative. What do I mean by that? Well, there are the facts of history, things like Augustine was born in this year, in this town, to this mother and father. He died in this year, in this town. There, you know, there are facts of history. And I don't think the critics generally attack brute facts, as it were. But where the critics tend to attack is in the narrative. What does it mean? And there is a striking um, anti-Augustine response from critics who this, it's not clear that this is fair, but at the same point in time, it's, it's very suspicious. These tend to be critics from the Pelagian side, for lack of a better word, of Christianity. People who believe, not, and I'm not accusing Augustine's critics of being heretics here, but what I am saying is on the issues of Augustine versus Pelagius, this defining moment in Western Christianity, the recent modern critics seem to be nothing more than partisans advancing these critical narratives. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with being critical per se. But I think what happens is, is if some people have portrayed Augustine hagiographically, which is to say so positively that they've built him into this larger than life figure that couldn't possibly be true. If that's happened, there is a danger on the other side. And that is that there are there can be figures who can portray Augustine so anti hagiographically as to as to turn all of his positives into negatives. And so I'm reading from the Cambridge Companion to Augustine. And this is from the Cambridge Companions to Philosophy series. And this is a series of essays from multiple contributors, perhaps most of whom are, are from this anti-Augustinian school, these modern schools. And so I'm just looking at, in chapter one, from Professor James O'Donnell. And it's, it's entitled, Augustine, His Time and Lives. Now, that's interesting, Chuck, because it's common in English to say, you know, the life and times of a person. But here, Professor O'Donnell is talking about Augustine's lives, like he's a cat. And we're going to see in that chapter, you know, he speaks of Augustine the way a modern propagandist would would try to would try in a jaded sense to advance his own partisan ideas. And so we hear one thing, for example, is the first thing James O'Donnell says is he notes that there is there is a figure in recent history, Peter Brown, who worked to make Augustine very famous in our day. And this idea is that Peter Brown is part of this pro-Augustinian establishment that seeks to, to, to canonize and to hagiographize Augustine in ways that are very distorted in the positive sense. And so he speaks about Brown offering this continuing reimagination of Augustine's age. And so we're we're placed in this we're placed in the situation where historians are throwing narratives at each other and and who's right so we hear we hear things that are not outright denials of the brute facts of augustine's life but we hear things that are that are very well let, for lack of a better word anti hagiographic and so one of the things the professor says in this essay he says this he says augustine himself is a figure whose life we know too well. He has offered us such a variety of materials for reconstructing his life that it would be almost impossible to not use them. Well, that doesn't sound anti-hagiographic. Well, it almost sounds like, and when we talk more about what the professor has to say in this essay, it almost sounds like he's saying, gosh, the only way we can talk about this Augustine fella is by listening to him talk about his own writings, which, you know, as we from the critical school know, is is always a dangerous thing. I think that's going to be the tone there. And I think he's going to, the work from this companion with the work of Brown, which he's going to put in the hagiographic category. So he'll say things like, the confessions are not an autobiography in any useful sense of the word but they contain autobiographical 
narrative and vignettes whose power to recount Augustine's life no recounter can resist. Well, that's really weird. It, it's almost a left-hand compliment. Sure, Augustine's confessions are such a bedrock from that period. But you know, no one can resist them. And, and what's, what's the underlying, perhaps implicit question? Is that maybe you should resist them. He says later, the confessions are the chief instrument by which Augustine shaped the narratives of his life. Well, if, if by it you mean Augustine wrote about himself, then what author is not doing this? So there's this passive tone to it. And he says right after that, this issue has generally been not whether he is right in the frame he gives his narrative, but rather whether we have adequately tested his narrative in detail at all points against the other fact. But he is virtually our sole source of fact. Boom. Wow. We have Augustine's writings, and yet the only thing we have about Augustine are his writings. And oh, woe is me. Now, listen to this. We have today some five million words from Augustine's pen, vastly more than we have from any of the famous writers of antiquity. Now, listen to this. None of that material survives against Augustine's will. Augustine shaped his own survival with great care. Chuck, this, this sounds a little bit slimy. I mean, that's not a scholarly evaluation, but it seems really hard to sell this narrative of, of this, this Augustine who's, who's crafting his legacy for 17, 1800 years with such skill in almost, dare we put it, a Machiavellian sort of sense. And so he continues and says, we begin with the textual Augustine, who lies heavy on our shell, proceed through the public Augustine, or rather the several Augustine known to different publics in his lifetime, and come only at the end to the man and his ultimate self-presentation. What are, This sounds like Augustine is the man of a thousand masks. Maybe Augustine, uh, maybe Lon Chaney is really Augustine reincarnated. In any sense, we see these attacks at the periphery, there are going to be other attacks that strike more centrally. But Chuck, I just want to throw that out at you and say, this is a really unusual tone to have in a scholarly analysis. What do you think about some of what maybe you've heard Augustine's critics talking about in recent centuries? I will, I will say that most of the criticism that I've read, and this is partly a function of where I've been reading and not so much that this means this is the criticism that's that's mostly out there has been internal to christianity and is and primarily comes from folks who perhaps tend towards the pelagian folks who want to believe that Jesus was right that humans are innately good and it is only it is not their nature to be evil but rather evil is sort of the seed that's planted later on and obviously augustine opposes that and now I'm not saying that all of his Christian opponents are Pelagian, but there is, I think, in certain certain of the criticism, a Pelagian or at least a semi-Pelagian tone to that. So, but but I want to respond to to the critics that that you've been citing as well, because I do find it, 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 I agree that it, it's sort of a strange criticism. On the other hand. I think it is a criticism that comes out of some things that are happening in in literary criticism and historical criticism. Not, you know, and a lot of times when we talk about historical criticism, we're talking about of, of scripture. And I'm, I don't mean that particularly. I mean, sort of more generally, which is the question of how how do we read an author? How do we read them? Do we need to understand them in the context of their you know, of their biography, of who they were, their culture? Or is there something, do we have to strip that away? And is the, re, is the true meaning of words that we're reading from an author only how they impact us as individuals? And that's a very, it's a very modern way of thinking, isn't it? You know, that, that puts the individual at the center. So that even, even when you're reading somebody's writing, the center is the actual, the individual reading rather than the author. But it, it does seem like that that's to some extent what's happening in, in the critic that you're, that you're citing. 
I'm also aware, though, that, that that there is somewhat of a, I haven't gotten too deep into it, but I, I am aware that there is somewhat of a back and forth on some of these issues. And even in in literature, there's a lot of discussion about what is the role of the author as opposed to the role of the reader when it comes to interpreting and understanding the words of an author. I may have mentioned this in the, in the past, but about a year ago, I finished, uh, it took me probably about a year, so I probably started about two years ago, but I read a series of books by the Norwegian author Carl Uwe Knausgaard, and he wrote the six-book series entitled My Struggle, purposely named that. You know, it, it's supposed to right away get you thinking, what? That sounds like the Hitler book. But it is, it, it is in many ways an autobiography, his autobiography, but it is not the typical autobiography. It's not, you know, literally, you know, taking you literally through his life. It's not taking certain high points and, and explicating them, but it's rather sort of, it's, it's something extremely different. And what Knausgaard is, is doing, I think, in writing this series of six novels, or perhaps it's a long novel, but it's a it's a novel, but it's also an autobiography. And, you know, there are all sorts of issues about how much of this is fiction and how much of this is not fiction. And, and do we, should we care? There's a lot of questions about is is the author, you know, tr trying to shift things in, in his way? Who What are we supposed to be reading here? What are we supposed to be getting out of it? But there's a lot of commentary about Knausgaard's books that are really about this idea that Knausgaard may be challenging this new way of thinking that we don't really care about the author, him or herself, or the author's intent, but it's only how we read and how we understand, and that Knausgaard is in some ways purposely messing with his audience in, in sort of making the point that, no, there there is something more to that. And interestingly, there is, I, I read a while back, an article um, from the Catholic Herald entitled Confessions of a Scandinavian St. Augustine, Carl Ovi Knausgaard being that Scandinavian St. Augustine. And and they're not saying that in some way Knausgaard is equivalent to Augustine as being this great dogmatician or anything of, of the sort. In fact, nothing of the sort. Uh, Knausgaard uh, certainly has been impacted by religion, and he discusses religion, and it's it's especially one of the six novels. It's maybe central to to that particular novel is is his relationship with religion, a relationship that is still sort of amorphous and you don't quite know where he's gone you know and, and of course in Norway Norway being one of the least religious countries in Europe the very fact that he acknowledges having a Christian upbringing and having these friends who are Christian make him somewhat unusual but but the reason why this author in the in the Catholic Herald refers to Knausgaard as sort of a modern Scandinavian Saint Augustine is because he does some of the same things Augustine does which is to use his life, to use stories of his life, not in a strictly, you know, literal historical manner. You know, this is not, you know, this is not a autobiography that is designed in the end to only bring you to, oh, I now understand what happened on such and such day in the life of Karl Ove Knausgaard or in the day of St. Augustine but rather to apply that life and the lessons of that life to the reader in a way that they that they can understand uh, in a way that will get them to think about deeper issues and and that's what that's what Augustine does right his his stories of his life and you know the, the various things that that I think really attract a lot of readers to Augustine by the way are there for a particular purpose they're not autobiographical per se but rather they're there to in support of the dogmatic and philosophical points that Augustine is trying to make and the teaching that that Augustine is doing and perhaps here what 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 we've got now is this much more modern 
way of thinking that is so, you know, so centered on the reader where all that's important is the reader. Well, Augustine didn't write in that way that, you know, Augustine wanted the reader to pick things up, but he had, a you know, he had particular messages. He had particular ideas that he was trying to carry across to, to his, uh, to his readers. And, and I would submit that perhaps some of the criticism that you've cited from folks who, you know, d- don't like this hagiographic hey, Augustine. And on the one hand, of course, we should always challenge uncritical views of, of mere humans. On the other hand, we don't challenge them solely just to break them down. You know, you know, we, we challenge them because we want to make sure that what we're getting is a true sense of what it is that they're writing and that we understand and can both engage with criticize when necessary, learn from, when appropriate, those writings. And and Augustine, I think, is perhaps one of the greatest examples in all of human writing of someone who was able to use sort of an autobiography or writing about oneself as a, as a way of not merely building oneself up, because certainly Augustine isn't trying to build himself up. He he sees himself as, as the greatest of all sinners, but rather as a way of imparting information and knowledge and, and truth to the reader about something much greater than the reader themselves, but about something that is far beyond them, their creator, about salvation, about you know, how those things all work together and, and what in the, the gospel message in, in essence. And so you know, it, it may seem a little over the top to describe somebody like Carl Uwe Knausgaard as as a, a modern Norwegian or Scandinavian Saint Augustine, but it was interesting to me that I think what what Knausgaard was doing is perhaps answering in some ways the type of criticisms, whether they're specific to Augustine or they're you know or more generalized. But the types of criticisms that you're you're also citing here and and concerned about. So I, I will admit that until until last week, when 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 we were talking a little bit about Augustine, I never quite realized that I was going to be able to sort of connect these two characters. This 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 crazy author from Norway who lives in Sweden and writes you know 2,500 pages about himself in sort of a novel, not novel, and Saint Augustine. But but it, there is some there is something to that, and I think he. Is is sort of counter criticizing some of that criticism that you've that you've cited. So it's just just real interesting. I you know if there are if there are people who enjoy reading that kind of level of literature, it, it might be it, you know it might be worth a, a, a dive. Although it's let me tell you, it's a long dive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that, Chuck. Um, I think there is a there is a genre of modern literature. And I don't mean by calling it modern literature that you can't ever find examples of this kind of writing in other time periods. But I think it seems to have come into its own as a tool of criticism. And I think it's maybe summarized in what what, what some people call the left-handed compliment. So I think, for example, reading in it's when you it's when you use when you use a device that's meant to be edifying, but you're actually using that device to do the opposite. And so I think, for example, is it, is it, oh, help me, in, in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, I think it's Mark Antony who has the famous, I come not to bury Caesar, but to praise Caesar, and ends up in the speech doing the exact opposite. And so this idea of the left-hand compliment, I share this, and we were talking about Robert Paul Wolf, and uh, he had a really great left-handed compliment that he just put on his blog last week. And so Robert Paul Wolf writes in his blog entry, he said, a former student sent me a picture of his car with the passenger side window broken. And the caption to the picture read, I had an awful day today. I had two volumes of the work of Hegel in my car, and someone broke in and left two more. Now that's that's a joke. You know, you're 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 in bad shape if somebody breaks in to to steal the volumes of Hegel in your car and puts them back and adds two more. And I think that's the kind of thing that, that we're seeing here with the anti-hagiographic 
works against Augustine. Now, let me continue with the essay here. And, and again, none of, this is, none of this is a direct and overt knife in the back, but, but it's a series of left-hand compliments that, that, that leaves me wondering if, if I should even uh, take the scholarship in this essay seriously. And, and in fact, it, it threatens to spoil the whole Cambridge Companion as being less than helpful. And so the professor continues here and says this, Augustine's book books are for the most part today presented to us by those in the contemporary world who see themselves as his co-religionists. It remains extraordinary that a provincial religious writer and churchman of 16 centuries ago should be so fortunate as to have his works presented to our world by a relatively homogenous and sympathetic body of interpreters. Well, another way of saying what he just wrote is, is that Augustine was not only a voluminous writer, but the people who wrote about Augustine were extraordinarily impressed, so much so that that the critical approach to him was almost non-existent, and that everybody who wrote about him described him in this giant side. Now, the next section continues, and I think we see some of what you had already hinted at, Chuck. The professor says, the controversy in which Augustine found was largely factitious. The Pelagianism that he attacked was a construct of his own, founded on his imputations of implications and logical conclusions to a writer that disowned most of them. Although Augustine's most extreme ideas were hotly confuted, he himself was rarely condemned as a heretic, and his opponents were strikingly reluctant to mention him by name. So great was the prestige he had created for himself. Now, I don't know what to say here. He literally said in the previous paragraph that Augustine is a scholar from, from provinces, a nobody. And, and then he's talking about having this gravitas, presence, that is so impressive that centuries after him, people are reluctant to speak of him critically. Now, which is it? I, I find this very difficult to, to reconcile. It says this, that the prestige had come in good measure from long years of assiduous literary self-promotion. Augustine had carefully built for himself a choice audience of readers for his work. We have a fairly full record of Augustine's correspondence with Jerome in Bethlehem, showing a fierce but repressed competition of egos between the two ambitious men. Augustine came on the scene years after Jerome and set out to achieve a similar kind of reputation. I, I don't know what to say. Am I reading the Cambridge Companion to Augustine? Or am I reading the, the, the tabloids, you know, the, the Sun News Herald or the, the Daily Examiner or uh, whatever, whatever are these, uh, these tabloids that they used to sell in the grocery stores that, that talked about that were so gossipy. And so you have this, you know, Augustine spent half his year in Carthage preaching, writing and debating. The audiences saw a learned and fluent preacher with a taste for the kind of debaters' tricks of language and argument that audiences love. They knew about his books, and they knew about his influence with powerful people. Many of those who knew him this way loathed him as a powerful figure in a party they abhorred, but such is the pathology of celebrity that loathing is part of his power. This Augustine reached the most people, however superficially. He and his followers believed that divine power flowed through his hand. And so, oh, here's another one. Augustine's congregation shared his sense of imperfection. To them, he was a hieratic figure, a dispenser of God's word and sacrament, but judge and jury as well. In increasing numbers, they came to him, divinely authorized and reliable, to settle their petty legal cases. These studies took place in a privileged space that Augustine carved out for himself. Augustine's choices in Hippo made him more visible and better known, and at the same time, more remote than a conventional cleric would have been. Now, he says this about 
the Confessions. We know by name no contemporary reader of the Confessions who was persuaded by its narrative. I, I don't know what to say, Chuck. I mean, this is scholarly skullduggery at its best. And, and you know, this is a generous theology program. We're really not trying to be aggressive here. But at the same point in time, when you see these kinds of accusations coming in a scholarly publication, it's shocking. And so I, I, I was just very shocked when I, when I saw this. And I thought to myself, you know, what, what does the author have to say about Bavink? You know, is, is Bavink enchanted by the myth of Augustine? You know, we have to ask that. And when everybody on the one side of the debate are mixed up, misunderstood, not able to, to realize that they're being manipulated by somebody who's provincial and, let sim and yet simultaneously the most advanced manipulator from antiquity, I, I don't know what to do. So again, I apologize. I didn't mean to ramble this far, but I thought it was really important to talk about this anti-hagiographic trend in recent scholarship to let people know, because who's familiar today with Augustine? and his literature. And this is very easy. I was just on social media today talking with somebody who said the very same kind of thing that, that Augustine's critics, Pelagian critics, are, are offering today, which is to say he's, he's just a smuggler of pagan philosophy into the church. And I'm really shocked to see the character assassination succeed. So, Chuck, th this, has been, this has been a lot dirtier than we, than we typically get here. And we haven't even gotten far into Bavink's presentation of the text tonight. And, and for that, I apologize. But I was just so moved by this that I thought I thought I had to share it. So so let me throw it over to you for some for some final thoughts here. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate your taking the time to to go through that. And it, it's certainly worth I think it's worth thinking about why is it that we have these kind of criticisms and what is the nature of those criticisms? I think there is a sense in which, and, and perhaps this is a little bit of what's going on, there, there, there does seem to be a sense in which sometimes people almost feel the need to be outrageous in order to be heard. And, you know, and certainly that kind of criticism of Augustine in, in sort of in relationship to you know, a millennium and a half plus of of generally positive views of uh, Augustine. You know, maybe it may be purposeful. It may be designed to draw eyes to 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 get people to to think through things. And certainly, I think that anti hagiographic project there is some of that happening. There's there is there is desire by some to say, hey, we ought to rethink or. Or even if we don't rethink, we ought to make sure that our basis for thinking positively about certain writers is based on what they wrote rather than, you know, on something else. Now, you know, clearly, I think from a lot of what you've read, um, this critic went, you know, went quite far away down the road there and, 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 and perhaps was purposely. But I do, what, I, what I do think, you know, perhaps is the benefit of reading that kind of criticism is you know, to, to sort of recapitulate what I was saying before, the fact that somebody feels the need in, in you know, 20 years into the, the 21st century to write that kind of criticism about a guy who, you know, was around, you know, more than a millennium and a half ago in some ways is, you know, is proof that Augustine is still relevant, that Augustine still matters, that Augustine is still worth reading, that Augustine is still the Dr. Universalis who means so much to so many people and provides so much content and so much to think about because of the way he's written and because of what he's written. And so Augustine's legacy that Bobbing talks about, and, and here he's primarily talking about the, the, the late ancient writers and in into the, into the middle ages. But, you know, he, he points out what Bobbing does here is, is says, you know, you know, regardless of what some of these modern critics are saying, is that there are so many people who built on Augustine, whether it's people like Gregory the Great, whether it's uh, folks like Dora of Seville, whether it's even even folks related to the, the theologians of, of the time of, of Charlemagne, like Alcuin and, and, and folks like that, that 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 
through that period that we often think of as the Dark Ages, but you and I have discussed that they were hardly entirely dark. But uh, during that time period, Augustine and his legacy was preserved and was built on by all sorts of theologians and all sorts of philosophers, such that when we get to the Renaissance, we get to the Reformation, it's entirely understandable that once again, we have a flowering of those writing based on Augustine. It's no wonder that we have, whether it's popes, whether it's reformers like Luther and, and Calvin, heavily quoting from people like Augustine to back up their views of what's happening in, in the world of the church and in, in, as part of the Reformation. Because realistically, what Augustine did in his time was so important. And so even, even today, those who criticize Augustine, those who wish that he were not as important as he is, feel the need to take the time to, to criticize him because he is still relevant. 